Things are going to start happening to me now. You've done all the reading. You're a scholar. You're a professor. You've done all the reading. You've done the intellectual heavy lifting. More or less, he shouldn't die. You wouldn't know a fact if it begged you all night long. want to, like, um, you know, give the wrong impression, because I am, I, I am very high. F***ing ran up behind him with a hatchet. Smash, smash, smash. Yeah, care. I'm a libertarian. What I'm getting is, Did why? you vote for Joe Jorgensen or Trump? Who? That's Joe the, Jorgensen? That was the perfect answer, thank you. <laughs> that was... And welcome, everybody, to the LPR Libertarian Podcast Review. This is uh, Tyler Yonke, and we're talking about the fourth, final... Well, the third one with Pete Quinones, but the final one, the final one with Pete Quinones, the third one with him, it's the fourth one in this segment, in this series, maybe fifth if you add the one I did with Jose, Dead Man's Party, Leo Frank, we're talking about this one with Pete, I just thought I'd do a quick intro, maybe some disclaimers here, especially with the shit kicking off in, the, in this uh, Middle East, uh, and what this actually means. You may hear some things here that are a little bit provocative, you might even take them as anti-Semitic. That's not my intent. What this you need to understand is we're talking about this specific series, the specific issues that came out of there, the ADL that comes out of there with Leo Frank, and the problems with that into today. Right now, we're having the GOP, uh, Nikki Haley as an example, you have them lefties, righties, all saying, if you say one bad thing about Israel, it is anti-Semitic. I think that is just ridiculous. And 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 what you're the point of a lot of the stuff that Pete and I talk about, especially at the end, is the power that the ADL and the Israeli lobby and some of the Jewish people themselves have put together of this uh, trying to shame you into basically non-person you. And then you can be criticized, you can be killed, you can be whatever. It's no different than the BLM stuff. If you didn't put up a black square on your Instagram during the BLM uh, riots and protests that you were then against the black people. That's ridiculous. But the right is now taking that on. So it's perfectly fine to push back. I, I, I don't really uh, have much issue at all. Uh, and, and Pete may be completely different. He would probably disagree with me in this with Jewish people in general. I've just never had much of a problem. Uh, matter of fact, I grew up more on this conservative side of believing all the Ben Shapiro stuff. And since then, I've taken into account uh, some of the things Pete says, but I, I disagree with him on, on some of that as well. And um, uh, the Martyr Made podcast and then some other documentaries I've really dug into to understand the Middle East process to better understand uh, where the feelings are coming from. And what I've deduced is it's easy to now say this is a religious war uh, or and task everyone against each other. And to once again, if you can say someone is being anti-Semitic, if someone's a Nazi, now you don't need to listen to their point of view. So, you know, we go down this route. And once again, I just feel like a little <laughs> declaration of uh, my points on these things and really the, the culmination and what you come out of with the, the, the power and the propaganda of the ADL uh, of their, their beginnings uh, is really about victimhood. Um, and there's reasons to, to say that the, the Jewish people were, were victims at this time. Uh, I don't know that I'm not going to get into all that. But what happens with the ADL is you have one bad guy. And now you've got to um, protect Louis, Leo Frank. Now you've got to protect him somehow. Uh, you've got to, You can't even let one bad person go. I don't understand. He's a piece of shit. The fact that they tied themselves to this guy is to me their problem. And now we're exposing it. And if they're going to then say, um, you know, the ADL is going to now say, well, that's anti-Semitic. I'm sorry. You're going to have to look back all the pleadings, everything we've got here. It's a fast treasure trove of a lot of info. Now. Let me let me see if I could put this up on the screen real quick here. Um, here's my Substack, Substack.com, Tyler Yonke, or TylerYonke.com.substack. Either one of those I think will take you to the right spot. I have put all the links that I've, it, and, and it's a, your starting point: uh, books, um, uh, documentaries, uh, audio files. There's a tons of them out there. Um, the American Mercury they went through and, and they have. Uh, it's like a website that was started by. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name, I, but it doesn't matter. 
Uh, however, um, it, they've got a lot of stuff on there. They end up putting a lot of these books and a lot of these um, issues uh, or pleadings and whatnot into audio form. So there's links to them to um, YouTube where you can listen to a lot of that. That whole uh, Nation of Islam book is on audio uh, that they did as well. So if you don't want to get the book, it's in my pack over there. But if you don't want to get the book itself and you want to listen to it, you can do that. Once again, the starting links are all there. There's multiple websites. Go there and you can dive in for yourself and find everything else. If you have questions about this, send it to me. Uh, I think what we'll end up, this is the last one with Pete. And then I think I will do a complete kind of like overview and follow up if there's some other things here or some people have some questions. There you go. Four segments, three with Pete Quinones. I think it went really well. Uh, give his show, obviously, a like and a follow. Mine as well. And share this out there with people. I've put it in a playlist. You'll be able to see it. By the way, confirmation, Tom Woods coming on the show in about a month. Uh, I must thank Pete Quinones for helping me set that up. Big, big thanks to him. So um, without further ado, we're going to do Dead Man's Party. Party for Leo Frank. I don't, I haven't listened to the lyrics of Dead Man's Party in a long time. Maybe maybe it's grand uh, it's grandiose or, or it's um, making a big deal out of the dead man. I don't know. Or are we just celebrating the dead man? Either way, part four of Tyler Yonke's segments. Part three from Pete Quinones. Enjoy. No show. We're gonna wrap this up now, Tyler. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Pete. Uh, nice to talk to you in a time of peace. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Whoops. People uh, look back this at a few years and say, "Excuse me." Yeah. What's what are they talking about? What yeah. what was happening when when they recorded this? Um. Right. So, basically, ended on the guilty verdict last time, and um, then the appeals. You talked about the appeals, and I guess the commutation of the of the death sentence comes first, but. Before we do that, probably getting into the level of, I mean, <laughs> what the media did in the, the media blitz. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, let me let me start. I found this quote. This uh, guy, Leonard Dinnerstein, um, he was an author. He wrote a book about Leo Frank, and uh, I think for his dissertation. And then he's updated a bunch of times. Uh, now he's a scholar. But here, here I just thought thought this was, a, I found this last night and I just thought this was great. So he, this is how he acknowledges um, anti-Semitism. He said that in uh, anti, the, the anti says anti-Semitism in Atlanta, quote, was evident in the widespread acceptance of Negro Jim Conley's testimony. I mean, if that doesn't say it all, it's like, it, and then kind of where we're at today as well, which is you go against our narrative, no matter what it is, you can't actually have a principled disagreement uh, and, and this is a lesser man, this Negro. Therefore, since you accepted his testimony, we are then you're anti-Semitic. That's that's the whole process. Well, something that we've definitely seen in the past uh, past week is that if you. If you even mention, you know, you're like, oh, wow, civilians died. I mean, that's that's freaking horrible. Well, civilians are going to die on the other side as well. It, it's either 100% you are for Israel and you are you are for the Zionists or you are against them. And we saw that with Tucker, when Tucker Carlson was interviewing uh, Vivek and um, Ben Shapiro did a completely insane rant commenting on it where he made zero sense. I mean, he, he he's yeah. th there was no facts and logic in there at all it was uh emotion and bloodlust and yeah so I, I think we know this we can see this in our current day that if you are not 100 percent behind uh, jews and or zionists you are you're anti-semitic and you know it's yeah, I think people I think a lot of people in the last few days have come to accept the fact that they're anti-Semitic. <laughs> well, and 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 I and, and I'd say that because that ties into kind of where the ADL is now and, and a lot of the stuff that we had with the, the, the press at the time. So it's just an important and by the way, my journey from this, we don't need to get too personal into it, which is I've I've used to bend and be more in the Ben Shapiro camp. You know, I'm not a, a Jewish person. Um, I'm, I'm religious. You know, you think that the Christians have to support that kind of thing. 
uh, and it was along the lines of, I remember telling someone how I didn't like Jimmy Carter and I'm like, he's anti-Semitic because he wrote some things pro-Palestine. You know, that's kind of the, the cudgel that you use and, and it shouldn't be done that way. Anyway, we can, we can, we can move on from that part. Okay. Go ahead. Um, okay. So let's talk about what we didn't really get into too much. We haven't, we skirted around a bunch is the news and the way that the, uh, the, the, the press really took this into account. Okay. And with that in mind, did they come into it right away? No, it took a little bit of time for some of these um, the northern Jewish uh, families and stuff to really push into this. It started with Albert Lasker. Okay, Albert Lasker, actually, it's his father, who um, I did, did find this out uh, yesterday. He was, uh, he was a confederate himself, uh, you know, slave-owning family that they had down there. Uh, and I think he was from Texas originally. So this Albert Lasker is the head of Lord and Thomas. He's kind of like the what they call them the unchallenged monarch of American consumer advertising, the founder of modern advertising. You you think of all these things that happened. He was the man that really pushed this. You know, kind of a change in 1913 with some of that. Uh, so he comes into prominence there. His dad said, "Hey, you got to take a look at this." And so he starts to um, to to take interest. A lot of the press um, did come into it right near the trial. You know, um, William Randolph Hearst threw someone down there for his newspapers. And there is some reporting, you know, claims on some books and stuff that uh, the news, uh, the, the emphasis by the North changed the trial because they couldn't come out as uh, anti-black as they really wanted to do. You know, we've, we've shown things here. They definitely were. So they said they curtailed that some. However, the Nation of Islam book really shows how much uh, Lasker himself, you know, a, a man mostly of the South, although he lives now in, in Chicago, uh, 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 Adolf Ox, he was now running the New York Times, but he was actually a Southerner too. They had strong, strong feelings about uh, as slavery, uh, the black man. Uh, they weren't any better. So I don't know that that necessarily played into it, but it, it drew some interest and there still was a little bit in the north, some of this pretension that uh, we're going to give blacks at least their due. So they had to restrain that a little bit. Uh, Albert Lasker, he really pushes this. And the, the, the key for him, it, so they come in mostly after the trial, but the key for him was he had a ton of money. He put over $120,000 of his own money in there, $1913. So I think uh, the, the book, uh, they, they translated that to like 2.9 in 2016. It's still a lot of money even for today of his personal money. But the big thing he had was connections and then he had pull. So think of the guy that's the advertiser and you're now running a newspaper. And how does your newspaper thrive on advertising? If this guy wants one direction for you to go, you might be going that way. You might start changing your attitude or your editorials, the way your news stories are simply by the fact that you're going to get better advertising through Albert Lasker. So that was one big uh, thing he had. What was interesting, and I'll get right to this on, on him. So um, he, he said, let me give you this quote here. He, he, in his biography, he reeled that uh, upon his first personal meeting with Frank, Leo Frank, uh, he, preserved, he perceived him as, quote, a pervert and a disgusting individual, so much that he even hoped that he managed, uh, that if Frank managed to get free, the latter would quickly perish in some accident. Furthermore, in his private correspondence, he freely admitted that a large fraction of the massive funding that he and his numerous and other wealthy Jews from across the country were providing had been spent on perjured testimony, and there was also strong hints that he explored bribing various judges. Given these facts, Lasker and Frank's other major backers were clearly guilty of serious felonies uh, and could have received lengthy prison terms for their illegal contact. So once again, we talked about the money. That was the big thing from the trial till the appeals was going through with this Burns investigator uh, trying to change the testimony a lot. Okay, so Albert Lasker, he then brings in Lewis Marshall. Lewis Marshall was uh, the American Jewish Committee president. He was an attorney. He was really well connected. Some say he might be have been the most uh, uh, highest praised or, or thought of prominent, I guess would be the word Jewish man in the country at the time. Uh, he had backdoor dealings with uh, SCOTUS. He was he knew uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson. He became the lead attorney for the Leo Frank after the trial and through all the stuff. So his connections were huge as well. Uh, along with Lasker, they then uh, recruited Al Adolf Ox. Now, Adolf Ox at the time, he was from the South, but he was now the owner of the New York Times. 
uh, this guy, he, he liked, he liked to put down the blacks as well. He, but he really got involved in this thing. And I, I just wonder, uh, what's interesting in here. Once again, we'll, we'll say another thing. Um, was, he had a quote here, uh, Lasker convinced his, of his innocence. No, at no point was I convinced of his innocence. Um, he also said, uh, on the death of Frank, I'm sure that it was a relief to Mr. Ox who Frank lynched, uh, who have Frank lynched and out of the way, I have felt for some time that he secretly despised Frank. That's what one person said of Albert Ox after he was done. So uh, these guys did not like him. They said, uh, and I have some other quotes we could kind of go through as to what their uh, whole feeling was. They also then brought in Jacob Schiff. Jacob Schiff was a Wall Street financier at the time. Shocker. Oh, I know I, I know who Jacob Schiff is. Okay. <laughs> what do you know about him? Um, he financed the Bolshevik re revolution. Okay. Well, in, he in, also in Russia. I mean, to to the tune of two hundred million dollars. Do you know how much? Do you know how much that was in in um, 19, nineteen early nineteen hundreds money? I can't even imagine how many billion trillion. Two billion. Okay. There you go. Yeah, that's how much. That, that's how much he wanted to get revenge upon the uh, the Russians for the Pale of Settlement. Wow. Well, <laughs> what's interesting, his connection, he started and he was a financier. He was helping this as well. But his thing actually is he had connections with Georgia and Slayton, the governor Slayton. And he actually there was a to, to help with um, the the fund some cotton uh, industries and, and through the state there. He got I think it was one hundred and thirty nine million dollar loan for the state of Georgia. This is right at the time of the commutation, because remember when um, Judge Slayton commutes and we'll get the spoiler, uh, when he commutes uh, Leo Frank's uh, sentence, he then gets, is out of office in like a few weeks, if even mm -hmm. that long. So he then, Jacob Schiff, tries to, um, through um, Marshall, the, the attorney, tries to have uh, Slayton, because Slayton was an attorney as well, we'll get to his dealings, uh, wanted to have him nominated for SCOTUS. And then um, actually William Randolph Hearst had even written some things and wanted Slayton to be the VP choice for Woodrow Wilson. So, and, and uh, William Randolph Hearst, we're not even really getting get into much of him other than he had a bunch of connections, a bunch of newspapers, and he was pushing the same thing. Once again, from advertising, um, I don't even know much. I didn't dig into Hearst. He wasn't as, as interesting to me on some of these. Um, some celebrities that were uh, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Jane Adams, they all were pushing for Leo Frank's uh, innocence as we. <laughs> Henry Ford? Uh, that's what that's what I got out of uh, one clip. So I, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps that's true. Interesting. The man, the man who wrote The International Jew. Uh... <laughs> well, may, maybe, maybe at some time later, he's like, you know what? He, he wasn't because when did he write that? Because it was uh, later, wasn't it? Yeah, I can't remember. But go on. Keep going. All right. Uh, one of the best, look, like I said, this changed some strategy as far as the thing goes, but one of the best things that comes out of this, and, and once again, like I've said, if you are uh, super, or you're interested in this at all, or someone's pushing you, the best sources are the original sources. And one of the guys with some of the ri best original sources were this guy, is this guy, Thomas E. Watson. He was a populist at the time. He had, a, he was an attorney. I think he was even a congressman. Uh, he ended up starting his own, um, I would say reg, but his own uh, newsletter, uh, and he started pushing back on the trial. What is interesting, when they always talk about anti-Semitism, they bring up Tom Watson, because he kind of turned that way. But he was mostly uh, anti-Black and very anti-Catholic, extremely anti-Catholic. So when we talked earlier about the cabbage and Mary Fagan, you know, being a Catholic girl, this is a guy that's like, eh, you know, actually, um, I'm going with him. Plus, if you do check out his writings, and they're all there, you can still find them. Uh, and I'll, at the end, maybe I'll talk about all the, some of the sources we have, because there's some great sources the way they put these on audio. Uh, so all his writings are, are still out there. He did not start writing uh, about the trial until after it was over. So the anti-Semitism, because, you know, look, it, let's say there was some anti-Semitism from 1913 after the trial to the, to the appeal. Okay, maybe. But does that matter? Did that really... I'm, it doesn't matter for the appeals because the appeals were he couldn't get due process because of the anti-Semitism in the South. So we're just wiping that out. Tom Watson didn't start his his fervor uh, in one of his most famous uh, things. He's called him the pervert Jew. That's what he started to call Leo Frank, which is what Albert Ox thought of him, which is what Albert, uh, I'm sorry, Adolf Ox and uh, Lasker thought of him as well. So yeah. is it out of the, out of the, no, it's, by the way, if you look at his writings, uh, Tom Watson, 
he's very he's very good fun to read uh i'm not saying i agree with everything i'm just saying he's a great writer uh but he wrote in defense of the jews many times before the whole trial so he got and and we'll tie this in here because tom watson is is a very strong individual the North comes down, and even Albert Ox and Laskers talked about later on where they overplayed their hand. We came in, we tried to destroy Georgia in a sense, and then what happened? And they didn't take this guy seriously. Tom Watson happened. Tom Watson happened, and he just eviscerates them point by point, recapping the trial. He's, he knows all the legal jargon, and he knows all the, the, the laws from down there. He talks about one of them, Venue. They could have easily, because they're like, look, we're in Atlanta. We didn't get a fair trial. Okay, you know what you could have done? You could have asked for a change of venue. You never did that. And he breaks down how they could have done that and likelihood of, of, of actually winning on that and had your trial somewhere other than Atlanta. But they were cocky, and they thought that they would get Leo because we have a black man that's going to testify. So Tom Watson happens. The, the New York Times can't even compete with him. He's just he, he destroys them. He knows way too much, and he takes them on the facts. Uh, so that, to me, is in a, his reasoning why he turns on the Jewish people. What, by the way, he had defended them in court. He is an attorney. Uh, he they advertised in his magazine. None of this anti-Jewish sentiment came about during the trial. Once again, it's just not evident in any of the writings. So that just doesn't happen. Anyway, so that's kind of the news story around there as far as the, the newspaper's influence. Um, one other thing, uh, I'd say it real quick here. Uh, seven months before he's killed the new york times writes an article about um, they expect him to be lynched at some point or they're they're, they're saying that's going to happen and they call this group the night we've heard it's an anonymous source the knights of mary fagan and it comes to that, that's our one by the way that's one of the best conspiracies of this and we'll get to that in the end okay. any anything you wanted to say about the the news stuff uh no let's get into um slayton and uh what 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 most likely caused him to commute the death sentence? Right. So one of the first things I did, by the way, when I started reading all this, because it's twenty eight pages, the f- easiest thing to do to kind of get a, a breadth of this is you read Governor Slayton's commutation uh, uh, report. It breaks down the facts. It says everything. And I came from that, and uh, my first thought was, oh yeah, um, Jim Conley is just a disgusting person. He's not he's not that great, and then you go through all the facts of it and you kind of backtrack and you go, oh, okay, you know what? He was a product of his times. Uh, I don't think he was all that bad, but governor Slayton did commute the sentence and he conducted like a four or five day inquiry. He had people testify again. Um, you know, Dorsey, the prosecutor was like, look, this is BS. We've already done this. Uh, you know, but Slayton wanted to do this. He said it was the right thing to do. And in the end, he decided to commute the sentence from life in prison to, uh, I'm sorry, to life in prison from uh, hanging. And uh, we'll get to his connections, but here's what he found, though, still in his in his commutation. There was no error of law. There was sufficient evidence to sustain the verdict. Uh, he felt like an imprisonment uh, represented justice, also reserved for convicted uh, murderers. Uh, as far as the anti-Semitic mob, he said no such attack was made and none was contemplated. Uh, he said Jews were revered and contributed greatly to the development of slavery-dependent Jim Crow state. Okay, <laughs> I always uh, look. You got it. You got to do this because now you you look at the ADL and there. And I'll I'll play. I will get to that. Uh, he made his commutation based on what he considered new evidence, much of which was produced by the disgraced detective William J. Burns, who we've talked about. Ox. Uh, Lasker all said they perjured pe- people up and down the, the state of Georgia trying to get this thing. So that was his. Of Connolly, the black guy, he said, the evidence shows that Connolly was as depraved and lecherous a Negro as ever lived in Georgia. There you go. By the way, uh, I don't know if we, we finished this, which is um, Jim Connolly does get convicted for uh, like an accessory after the fact, spends a year in jail for, for his crime. And... Um, Dies, you know, ripe old age, I think in the 1940s, 1960s, something like that. Uh, never hit the, the news wires again for crimes, which if he was this disgusting sexual pervert, by the way, that movie I saw in, uh, in the 1988 one, he is, he's like Gollum in a cell and this black lady there. And he's, I, he's almost like jerking off because he's just so, they, they show him as just this lascivious, uh, oversexed person. It's, it's wild. It's wild. 
Yeah, I'm not shocked. I mean, who made that? Hollywood? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, Bob Lemon, uh, the Bob Le- Lennon, Bob Lemon. He was the old guy, the dirty, grump, grumpy old man. Uh, um, is that his name? Is that his name? Uh, Jack Lemon. Jack Lemon. Sorry, he yeah, he yeah. played Slayton. And by the way, there's an old movie in the '60s where Walter Matthau plays Slayton. So those guys team up to play the same oh, guy, and funny. then later on, they're grumpy old men. The original. Well, and weren't they the original Odd Couple too? I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So. They just had the, once again. Yes, they were. Yeah, and I think Charles Dutton actually played. Um, Charles E. Dutton was the yes, the, yeah, the yeah. black guy. The, yeah. yeah, it's 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 All wild. Right. All right, so um, commutation of the death sentence, and um... by the way, uh, I just remembered yeah. something. Sure, uh, yeah. Albert Ox and some of these they decide to do run a portrayal of the the crimes at one point. So they have actors and they do all this stuff. Uh, and I always find this funny because um, if you've ever seen Birth of a Nation, they like to do this too, which is you can't use a black man to portray a black man. You use a white person in blackface. And it's uh, it, it looks so creepy from now. But anyway, he did that as well. Um, but yeah. That's all, that's that's amazing. Yeah. So um, commutes a death sentence. And then um, some people start moving and going, uh, you know, just making decisions. Yeah, so uh, Slayton actually he takes off, and and they 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 move the the prison for where Leo Frank is from one to another. By the way, if you read all the stuff about um, the the discussion at this point, Leo Frank is really loving his notoriety. He's starting to have people come visit him at the at the uh, the prison. He he talks about how wonderful his conditions are there. Uh, people are sending him money, and he's just he's loving life the way it is. Uh, they move. Uh, he gets slashed in the neck at one point. Um, someone tries to kill him. Uh, they save his life, and then uh, a few days or a week or so later, uh, a lynch mob breaks into prison. This is uh, like uh, a team or something. Breaks into into prison, takes him out to uh, I think it was in Milledgeville, and they take him to uh, Marietta, where uh, Mary Fagan uh, was born, and they string him up and they hold they they lynch him basically. So. Uh, and there is there's actually a picture out there. Yeah. Yeah, there is. We won't uh <laughs> we won't be providing that or anything. No, they they put a nice cloth over his face though, so you it can't is. really tell. Yeah. Yeah. So um well <laughs> why don't you talk about the fact that it does eventually I mean he does get I mean this is jumping forward. He does get pardoned. Yeah, maybe we need to finish off Slayton because there is one connection we didn't. Yeah, yeah, we didn't, yeah. T- we didn't talk about there. Slayton's I mean, we can do the Slayton World Tour. Well, yeah, you might know a little bit more about that than me. Actually, uh, what I found was okay. He's governor from 1911 to 1915. You know, the murder happens in 1913, so there's a, what a two-year span that he uh, of elections. He just gets elected governor right before the murder or around there. Uh, and he had merged because he's an attorney. He had merged law firms with Luther Rosser, who was the criminal, uh, the defense attorney for Leo Frank. OK, they had just merged. So he can't practice law. So he's not doing that. But let me tell you, after <laughs> after he uh, commutes sentence and he's done, he goes back and works for the law firm. Uh, like I said, Jacob Schiff tried to get him either put on uh, SCOTUS. Uh, William Ramder first tried to put him on uh, as a vice president. Schiff's letters to um, to Slayton indicated that he would give him this cotton loan of hundred. Like I said, like I think it was a hundred thirty nine million dollar loan. But first, thing he asked him, "How do you feel about Leo Frank's innocence?" And by the way, this money is he hinted it was conditional on that. So y- y- anyway there's good connection that um, Slayton was perhaps bought off or he thought it was in his best interest to do this. Plus, as you can see what he thought about uh, Frank uh, or uh, Jim Connolly, um, you just believe the, the quote unquote, I have to do it for you, Pete white guy in this one. What do you know about, and by the way, he uh, Leo Frank's uh, murdered and um, Jim Connolly is actually in California at the time. And he hears the news. What do you know about him? From what I heard that um, Slayton immediately, once that happens and once the news of the, the lynching comes out, he immediately runs to New York mm. and he runs to the people who, you know, the, the, what they assume is the people who paid him uh, to do this. 
and there's no chance no one's going to run him for scotus now no one's going right. to run him for vice president now so they just hand him a bunch of cash and he goes and he just basically tours the world for a little while yeah which sounds about that, right yeah. yeah and i don't know i don't know how what how he ended up i didn't look into that but you know basically you know he committed a crime he committed a a crime quote unquote and then he ran and his uh the people he the people he did a favor for paid him handsomely and he decided to see the world yeah it, it did come across that as soon as like i said marshall uh, the the main uh, the the main attorney for uh, Frank after the fact the real connected guy uh, when Jacob Schiff um, said hey what about him for Scotus he's like yeah he basically he's not a smart guy I would I wouldn't put him up there uh, for any reason so um, yeah there we go so yep so he um all right go ahead go so what happens and and maybe do you want to talk about the lynching and the the conspiracy or do we save that Pete we tease the the folks here. No, go ahead and do it. <laughs> okay, so I mentioned um, this is what's this is what's great about the the NOI book here about the secret list of box and Jews. It's it's from a different perspective than perhaps we have, but it's one that's really interesting because they are um, they're coming at it from a, a, an aggrieved perspective as well. You know, and talk about all the lynchings that are happening in there. Slayton only is concerned, or these people only get riled up because one Jewish man gets uh, lynched. Yet Slayton never commuted the sentences for a bunch of others. By the way, it was they, they at one point went through page after page of just how the due process for blacks was at the time. They had transcripts from a court hearing and it's literally, you know, Mr. What's his name? You know, you step up. Did you take this lady's purse? No. 30 days. The next guy, did you do it? No. 30 days. And then one guy's like, hey, I said I didn't. He goes 60 days. And then he goes, what? I can't. And it's 90 days. Fine, two years. And that's that's the kind of it was like within, you know, five minutes, you're jailing, you know, the 15 mm -hmm. different black guys. So that's the way this was. Um, OK, so the the book indicates that there was such disgust for Leo Frank and he started to have talking. He started to have interviews. They said, no, you've got to stop this. Once again, they thought he was this complete pervert. I didn't like him from the moment I saw him. These are legit quotes that they, I never thought he was legally uh, guilty or innocent, I, I think, there, a, which is a weird phrase to use, to the point where they felt, and I, I did read that one quote, where they felt that him being dead was actually more of a benefit than not. Because the more he talks, the more interviews, now you commuted his sentence, you're not going to hang him? Fine, we got that because they actually thought we'd commute it. Maybe we'd get some sort of other release, but the lynching is a better deal. Now, the New York Times makes this thing about this these Knights of Mary Fagan. And if you, by the way, if you look up the the KKK, the second wave of the KKK, they always say, uh, you know, uh, Simmons started on the um, what was the mountain up there, Stone Mountain uh, out there in Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, and the Knights so of Mary Fagan. But the Knights of Mary Fagan never were. Of what you can tell were actually a group. Like I said, New York Times mentioned them seven weeks before. There was one other magazine, it was the Israelite, that had mentioned him. Great name. But that was actually the uh, brother-in-law of Al the, uh, Adolf Ox. So there's a connection there. This group then lynches him. They never said that there were any... Simmons never said... I think that's his name. Never said that there was uh, any connection to Knights of Mary Fagan. There was never a group associated with the Knights of Mary Fagan. So the Nation of Islam thing is, this could have been your first uh, false flag. Uh, we're basically, did they did they do the murder? Did they you know, try to have this guy lynched, maybe take him out themselves? Uh, possibly, I think that's a great uh, conspiracy to come away with. Either way, it was a benefit for the ADL and everyone else involved. Um, actually, probably on both sides to have this. The interesting part of the the Knights of Mary Fagan is you you, you mentioned the, the 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 picture of of Leo Frank being hung. Guys are sticking their head to try to get in the picture. They're not hiding their faces. They would take uh, pride in this, and that never happened. And by the way, Simmons also uh, uh, when they started the KKK at that point wrote proudly of the Jew or uh, nice of the Jews. He didn't have an issue with them. So once again, we just want to emphasize this KKK formation out of Mary Fagan anti-Semitism. The connections are not there. Well, the um, I guess one of the arguments is, and E. Michael Jones talks about this, is there's no real consciousness for anti-Semitism in the South at the time. But it really seems like because 
of everything that happened with this trial, everything surrounding it, the press, the the commutation, the the just everything that this was really like the the genesis of hey these people these people have a lot of power these people um seem to stick together and they want to be above the law maybe we uh maybe this is a group we need to look at uh the kkk or the or the other the, the jewish community <laughs> um well no i'm thinking the southerners oh. the southerners in general the consciousness this helps this helps to build the consciousness of um yeah, you know, the idea that Jews are just in it for themselves and they'll mm. do anything to protect their own people. And, very, you know, you know look, uh, you, you read the Tom Watson stuff. I mean, he was very uh, put her put her back by the the northern aggression <laughs> in words and the way that it's all went down. Very much could be. I mean, but but once again, uh, the birth of a nation comes out. I just want to emphasize this: the birth of a nation comes out in 1915. And uh, that's right out, you know, right around the lynching. Actually, it was after. It made a killing. It made a killing in uh, Georgia. Uh, I think that I mentioned that uh, MGM basically was founded off the funds that were created from that movie. There were Jewish, mm -hmm. uh, you know, brothers that had the the movie in the South. Uh, they said at what is it in um, seven thousand Jewish people in uh, Georgia at the, around the time of the trial. And there was a study done that it went from uh, 4,000 in 1910 to 12,000 in 1937. So you're looking at 300 Jews a year coming into the area. They, they, weren't, they weren't slowing themselves down. But the sentiment could very well have been, once again, uh, the way that the press really tried to push this as, uh, once again, we're backwards place, letting the black guy talk, everything. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so um, I know this is this is a little bit forward. Now let's get to the pardon. So to to even set up the pardon, the ADL forms nineteen thirteen. Once right. again, Livingston, this, this Livingston guy started it in Chicago, but he was had two hundred bucks in his office, and real the real power was down there in Georgia. So it comes out of the Bene Brith uh, situation, and why did I just lose my train of thought? <laughs> You were talking about um. We're, we're talk you said the ADL. We we're talking about the pardon. Oh, yeah. you, you, we got to start with the ADL. You know, luckily that doesn't happen to me in court. But if it does, I'll, I'll, I'll call up Pete. Um, so yeah. the ADL is pushing the the pardon for for quite some time. The the Georgia Board of Pardons is like, no, this isn't happening. We've already had everything. You know, good luck. Uh, however, in the 80s, suddenly there comes out. Um, I think it was 83 comes out this guy, um, Alonzo Mann. Now, Alonzo Mann, if you remember way back from episode one, he was a, a witness in the trial. He's a 13-year-old boy that testifies that he's in the facility, leaves uh, that day at 11.30, said there were some people there, Does it, couldn't recognize Mary Fagan if he saw her in front of him. He'd, all, he'd just started in uh, 1st of April. It only worked two Saturdays, so he may or may not have seen Conley. Suddenly in his 80s, he has a recollection that everything's changed and that Jim Connolly, he had actually seen him there carrying Mary Fagan over his shoulder and uh, ran into the boy and said, hey, if you say anything, I'm going to kill you. So what's this kid do? He goes home, tells his parents, and they're like, let's see how things play out. That, that black man seemed uh, really dangerous. So uh, he goes and testifies at the trial. Uh, you know, not much in there. And like I said, 83 some years later, now he's got a change of his story. Uh, once again, the best part about, look, there's several books um, that, that perpetuate um, myths over the years. One of them talks about kill the Jew or we'll kill you. That was a, a phrase that happened. The first writing that that ever came out to, in was like 1965. So you go back to all the contemporaneous stuff. It's never there. He repeats that. Oh, there was a guy when he went to the courthouse, had a gun. Now, let's think back here. Who are you more afraid of? Are you really afraid of Jim Conley, who gets arrested on May 8th? and is incarcerated all throughout the trial, spends a year in jail after the fact, are you really worried he's going to kill you and your family in the South, in Georgia? It's, it doesn't make yeah. any sense. So with this, um, this, this new revelation, you know, uh, the whole story comes about, the Tennessean writes a big article about it. Now the ADL is on the path. They send it back over to the, uh, the, the Board of uh, Pardons to do this. And they have Mr. Mann there with him to basically show off to the board about how this guy it's it now he's he, i think he's senile honestly because when you read the transcript of that 
uh, his attorney is saying, hey, this happened. And he's like, I don't, what? And I mean, he's not there. And the attorney's trying to give the answers. They turn him down. However, they come back a few years later and the board of pardons, I think it just gets so inundated with the pressure that they actually, um, they do pardon him. But this is important because, uh, let me see if I could get to the actual pardon statement here. Um, let's go, I have it in my book here. So, uh, cause it's what's important is everyone, if you even watch on the ADL the website, um, and they have a little thing about the ADL, the formation, the hundred year thing that they had, it talks about now he's been pardoned. Um, but, um, I think this is, oh, here we go. This is what they said without attempting to address the question of guilt or innocence. And in recognition of the state's failure to protect the person of Leo M. Frank and thereby preserve his opportunity to continued legal appeal of his conviction and in recognition of the state's failure to bring his killers to justice and as an effort to heal old wounds, the State Board of Pardons and Paroles, in compliance with its constitutional and statutory authority, hereby grants Leo M. Frank a pardon. Now, they had denied it previously because he's not a live person. There's really nothing to pardon, and I think that's the statute. So it almost seems like illegally they didn't do the right thing. But it's important to note there, they emphasized, started out with, we're not talking about his guilt. This is simply, you took, we couldn't protect him. You took him out of the, the facility and you lynched him. Therefore, we're doing a posthumous pardon. That's it. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like the way they parade Biden around now, mm. who's a complete, you know, whose mind is completely gone. They bring this guy in. And um, yeah, all of a sudden, you know, it's like, oh, it took him, what, 70 years to, grow the nuts to to say this you know it's like now it's okay to say it you know yeah I mean, it makes it makes no sense i mean you would think he would have you know after the civil rights act oh now i'm protected i mean it's, it's just it, it's just ridiculous um did we talk about hoaxes uh we can talk about that one is um the bite marks or the kill the Jews or we'll kill you. That was kind of the, the first one right. to start with that. Since I mentioned it, um, the, the, the only way that they can trace any connection to that is uh, evidently um, Luther Rosser or the, the defense attorney at one point got a phone call preparing for trial and someone, you know, that said uh, kill the Jew or we'll kill you on the phone. And he's like, hey, he didn't do anything about it. He didn't really care because who cares? Uh, so no one ever said anything about that. And and it never, and I don't mean it that way, Pete, but that's fine. No, it's fine, but it's funny though. <laughs> no, but I mean, once again, we, we have to, uh, this is what's crazy. And I think this is the, the problem with like even the ADL. Uh, they want to go back in time uh, with, with today's standards to some extent, but not really because – if we did that back then, I mean, once again, it's it's a it's a Jewish man in in Atlanta. He's he's going to be thought of as upper class compared to anybody else. So, is that really anyway? The point was that was never said. Uh, you can't find it anywhere uh, except for you know after the fact when people in the '60s are starting to write books about that. Um, another one was bite marks. I think someone had commented about was there ever bite marks? This is another crazy thing where look, all the original materials out there. The, the, the coroner, uh, when they testified, uh, you know, from the autopsy, there was a lot they can actually do, especially science in 1913, the best that they could uh, muster up. Uh, but they, they didn't have x-ray technology, Pete. And people have now said, oh, you look at the pictures, there was actually bite marks. And, and, and no, there's no bite marks. It looks like the pro-Frank people trying to do something. I don't even really know where that goes because they take teeth impressions. Once again, if these are there, you could have done it. By the way, there was a bloody fingerprint uh, on one of the back doors, but they never, they could have asked uh, Conley to take a fingerprint and match it, but they didn't. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Um, there's, I don't know if any other folk, folk, folks, hoaxes, <laughs> big ones. Folks, like yeah. the folks, <laughs> foes. Um, well, I mean, I guess really the only, the only thing to wrap up with is um, the fact that this was all used to empower and create a, a, you know, an organization nowadays that is has international political power right and yeah i mean it's is it the first of its kind like that in the united states i think 
I'm trying to think. I mean, it would definitely be the most powerful. There may have been Jewish organizations before that. I mean, B'nai B'rith, but that's really just a secret society. Well, the AJC um, was kind of, it was a, that's the Marshall had that. It's the American Jewish Council. American Jewish Congress. Yeah, it's something like is that what it is? Um, but they were they were actually specifically tasked with trying to assimilate uh, rich German Jews into the U.S. That was kind of their thing, and that's that's where he had a lot of his money. But yeah, I, I mean, I take it. Uh, it's kind of like the the NAACP, the SLP, uh, or SPLC, uh, ACLU, even or the Rainbow Push Coalition. These are kind of all. Do you know what? Do you know what all those have in common? Uh, <laughs> do you know who started all of those? Uh, Leo Frank. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but people of a people who call themselves a certain background. Yeah. I know it's it is it's fascinating. Um, this is this is what I found off the ADL's website, which is um, that. There's uh, some videos they have, and one of them is uh, this is what they claim that they're fighting against the one they found this out. This is why they this is why they were created. And I could play this video; they might kind of try to strike you. Uh, but it says fighting against the one form of prejudice could not succeed without battling all forms of prejudice. Now that's what they said it stemmed from in 1913. Does that sound like they were worried about Jim Connolly's rights and hit the prejudice to him? Absolutely not. So, you know, if I, I this video is like a minute 40 or so. I don't want to play it. But if I did, we could just walk through all the false narratives that have been created because uh, we know all the facts now. And that's what's amazing about it. They just they say, oh, and he was pardoned. Oh, well, he wasn't really. I mean, that's these are important little distinctions uh, to know. So, um, by the way, did you uh, did you get a chance? I watched this documentary called Defamation. Um, did you happen to? I haven't watched. No, you you shared it with me. I haven't had a chance to watch it. Um, it's really hard to find, uh, and I finally found it, and I, I ripped a copy. So if anybody needs it, we can probably post it up. And it, it's a it's a um, Jewish Russian uh, from Israel. He decides to hey let's let's find out this whole thing about the ADL and and stuff. Uh, it starts out he's talking to his mom, and she's just she kind of rags on uh, <laughs> Israel and some other things. Uh, he follows a bunch of kids from Israel that go over to Germany to like, you know, Holocaust memorial type of stuff. And the, it's fear porn the entire time. And I think that's, that, that's what I found out about. And then he goes to the ADL with Abe Foxman and there, he goes, I want to do, I want to follow a, um, an incident that you have. Oh, okay. Let's find one. And so they're on there. Oh yeah. This person, uh, they had, a. Uh, uh, someone found a Nazi flag in their yard. So like, and like the, these are the things they're tracking. So at some point, and then he talked to uh, Norman Finkelstein, which was interesting as well. He talked to a, a more orthodox uh, Jew in New York. And the interesting part, especially the orthodox guy, was more along the lines of this Zionism stuff. It's What it does is it actually perpetuates anti-Semitism. And, mm -hmm. and then you go and you see, what's your definition of anti-Semitism? And it is so broad. Pete, it reminded me of the, the good old days of the Jesse Jackson, the Rain, Rainbow Push Coalition, where someone, I went to the University of Colorado. I'm out there. Uh, Coach McCartney, uh, he's done. So they hire Rick Neuheisel. He comes in. He's not Bob Simmons, who was supposed to take over as a black man. So Rain, Jesse Jackson comes out there and he just tells you how horrible you are. And he tries to, you know, basically... Um, I'll be good for you news-wise if you pay me off. And that's kind of what the whole thing is. So it's yeah. a very similar uh, feel that it has to that. Well, the ADL does that too when uh, – yeah. uh, what's that basketball player? Kyrie uh, Irving. Kyrie Irving. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When he – when he, part of his apology was writing a uh, – he had to write a check to the ADL. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's pretty much what we knew Jesse Jackson was doing. He would go in and he would basically say – look into a corporation and be like, you don't have enough black representation here. Um, either get black representation or you can write us a check. Yeah. And that's pretty much what, uh, I mean, where they learn that from, where do you learn that from? So, I mean, it's what I, what I found with the, the big connection, like you watch that documentary and you think about the Leo Frank thing, what, what came out of it, which was uh, uh, Leo Frank, which is uh, there is a lot for us to fear. Now, one of the incidences that the ADL showed was this girl that said, oh, woke up. this is just a recent video I saw. She wakes up, her friend sends her a text, and there on the chalkboard in the chemistry lab was a swastika. She was just in fear, Pete. He, she was in fear. Now, I, I've been, I, I'm not a, a Jew, but uh, things have happened to me, and um, I'm sorry, I just don't, I don't have the fear of every little thing at high school like that, and most people don't. 
But when these kids went and they visited uh, Auschwitz, uh, one girl is is on camera talking to the guy, and she's like, "Oh, I was it this morning?" And this guy was over there, and he started yelling uh, "Nazi" at me. And he he goes, "I was there." He didn't. And she goes, "Yeah, I know." So okay, that's that's a weird aspect for a teenage girl to do, but the, they instill the the fear of everything around the corner is going to be harmful and it's not healthy. It's it reminds me, you know, it was interesting. You talk about the Jesse Jackson and kind of the same idea. Of, of the blacks come out of the South and there is a lot of fear. They're getting lynched a lot, but at some point, where are we going from here, right? Are we going to allow this to envelop our lives? And is it a healthy situation? We, I, I'm sorry to preach on on this, but this is kind of what you see now and this, what we have of criticism has to be, and if you criticize in the wrong way, you're going to be labeled. And the label itself is the way that they can try to, uh, well, censor you. Right. Yeah, it was. Um, it really seems like they have their own history, and they create it. I don't know if you've seen the uh, Ben Shapiro history of Israel that's going around, where he just basically gives the Israeli side on everything. You know, no mention. You know, um, no mention of anything, any kind of no mention of. Um, King David hotel bombing, no of Ergon, no mention of Lehigh, um, no mention of the Levon affair, no mention of the USS Liberty, um, no mention of basically anything, anything, no mention of, he talks about how they acquired the Golan Heights uh, in the 60s. And it's like, you realize that that's like against internet against international law you cannot get you can't gain land by by war anymore and he what i just said i I don't know that's not my my thing uh i'm learning more but dave smith did break that down and i thought it was very good and he said one thing that i thought was actually great which i've actually had a judge tell my client which is you know, you come here to swear the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. The, uh, omissions are just as bad. And that's what Ben uh, failed to do because you can't have this honest uh, discussion. And and by the way, it's it's so weird to see a guy in Congress uh, who's a Christian wearing an IDF uniform. Um, you know, if, I'm German. Am I, <laughs> I'd be, you know, it, that would not happen. I, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um yeah, it's it, it, there. I I don't know how you know. It's <clears throat> a lot of what you've seen this week is um, h- how j- they basically want you to believe that Israelis are just good. They they never do anything wrong. Um, you know, no, there there are no settlements, no settlers. Uh, settlers never kill kids just for fun which they do, um, and kill Palestinian kids just for fun. They do. They're, they're, it's not human shields. It's, uh, you know, not them throwing stones and hiding. No, it's they just, the settlers are the most radical of the of these groups and uh, of, of the Israelis. And, um, yeah, you don't get that. And, you know, lies by, uh, lies by omission, if you're just going to tell, give your side of the story, um, I'm sorry, you've you've lost the right to be trusted. And as far as I'm, I mean, I've never trusted Ben Shapiro because for somebody who basically has made his fortune attacking identity politics, there is no bigger identity politics issue than Zionism. I mean, Zionism is, it's a supremacy religion. And... Yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine who grew up in a very strict Jewish family. She got out. She's uh, she's one of the smartest people I know. Um, she's one of the she's one of the most anti-Zionist people you will ever meet in your life. And you know, I told her, I said, if if we could just get if we could just break people's minds from this Zionism, um, it would be you know it would be great. And she said, you're still going to have to deal with the fact that Judaism. Just Judaism, regular Judaism, is a supremacist religion. And as long as you have a group that has power, that has wealth, um, that believes that they're supreme to everyone else, you have a real problem. 
you have a real problem. You mentioned something that triggered me there, or not, or made me think of something. Actually, not trigger, trigger. You triggered a thought. It used to be a good. <laughs> I triggered you. It used to be a good thing, which is I, I've heard actually Ben and I and I've I've tried to do this myself, which is uh, you know arguing politics. Ben Shapiro has said he tries not to argue them from a religious perspective. Um, okay, let's talk about abortion or pro whatever you want to talk about, and and because it doesn't, it immediately alienates some people. Yet. Is there anything about this uh, this current conflict that is not based in his religious perspective? So he he can't argue it from there. So there's been there's been some uh, really good uh, coming to Jesus moments for me at least uh, with him of like uh, yeah you're just I, I there's a lot of people there, out there right now. There was a time when I would listen to him every once in a while, 2017, 2018, um, you know when he was doing a lot of the takedowns of the of the yeah the growing woke at the time. And I remember him once saying, he said, I don't even consider people to be a Jew who were born into a Jewish family. You're not Jewish unless you practice the faith. And he doesn't believe that. He doesn't believe that because there is <laughs> Zionism is not a, is not, these aren't religious people. Most of them are atheists. They will be. They will be honest with you about that. Um, they pay very, very little lip service to the Old Testament. They talk about the Talmud, thing, and you know that's what they learn in yeshiva. That's what they learn in Hebrew school. And I mean, it's he. I've caught. He's been caught in so many, if not in so much inconsistency that he can't be taken seriously. He can't be taken seriously anymore. And with this whole thing, since this thing started, you just get to see how much of an emotional child he really is because he is, I mean, he's basically just throwing fits. Uh, yeah. I, I, he, he had had some tweet today. I, I have a, I'll just the last bit of it. He talks about, assurance by all the right people that Jews ought not to defend themselves. And I just replied, like, Jews are Israel. Right, what, what do you, because that to me is is part of the problem here. You know, America first suddenly turned into America first in line behind Ukraine and, and Israel. It's just, it's a weird concept for me uh, coming from like pretty conservative uh, upbringing to suddenly seeing this, uh, I don't know if the eyes are open more, but um, it's a, it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating few, few years for me. That's yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Well, I really appreciate this. This was fun. And also to get it um, to hear it from somebody who um, knows their way around a courtroom and um, had the mispleasure of being in law school. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> for sure. I'm sure I'm sure there was a lot of a lot of good good you took out of law school, but I'm sure there was a lot of waste of time there, too, <laughs> just like any other school. <laughs> like I said, at the, the first line, uh, first, it, they, at least my law school, they, they tell you we want you to try to think like an attorney. And for me, that was uh, was helpful. So yeah, I, once again, I really appreciate this. Look, the, what you can take away from this is if someone's bringing this Leo Frank thing up, now you you at least have parts of this. You know, like I said, when I first read the commutation, I'm like, oh, maybe this guy's in, and then you go through it and it's it's a it's a slam dunk case that um, people have had to glom onto. And and once again, why is this guy the, the person that, well, I think we've talked about it and it's to create, they they got caught up with themselves. They pushed this thing too hard and now they have to stick with it, um, which is it, it's fear porn. And um, you don't have to, you don't have to go down that route. You could easily say Leo Frank was a pervert Jew. <laughs> just, just like they, just like his, um, his fellow, his, the fellows who went down there to, um, to defend him. Yeah. Said, you know, he's a pervert, and um, maybe, maybe they did. Uh, eh, let's leave that alone. Yeah. Thank you, Tyler. I appreciate it. But she's back. And now. Chick Fil A is completely overrated. It's not that good. I prefer Zaxby's. I prefer Popeyes. Takes a tough man to make a tender forecast, Nick. And I guess that's me. <laughs> Keep fucking that chicken. <laughs> for, should I vote for Dick Cheney on the Libertarian Party? Do I yes. have an obligation to vote for Dick Cheney? I would say so. Yeah. Did it work for those people? No. It never does. I mean, these people somehow delude themselves into thinking it might, but... But it might work for us. That one dude was like, I'm a podcast. I can't find it anywhere. And they don't have video.
<laughs> oh yeah, Peter Janky. Yeah. Peter. Yeah, I blocked him. Uh, I'll do it. If he unblocks me, I'll. I'll... <laughs> He'll buy your shirt if you unblock him, Bert. He's a wigger. Yeah, nothing cooler than so a 49 year old like, yeah, I just started live streaming. Cut me some slack. I'm fucking. I'm pretty high tech for a boomer. Uh, but, anyways, I'm.